In this video, we are going to discuss about Twilight of a Crane written by Junji Kinoshita, the drama which is prescribed in your ordinary level syllabus. So in this presentation, I would be talking about uh, how this drama uh, becomes an important drama for your examination plus for your knowledge as well. For example, learning literature is not only passing the exam as far as I believe, it is a life skill. Therefore, I always believe learning literature uh, gives you kind of a profit connected to education and your improvement. But on the other hand, unknowingly, undercurrently, there is something, uh, something much more than happening un undercurrently. For example, uh, this gives you kind of broad perspective regarding life. The way that you look at life will be rather different. And unlike other students, that you get an opportunity to walk around and see people, meet people, and you uh, to more than, uh, during more than two and a half years, like you associate with multicultural uh, aspects in this particular syllabus, you pe meet people of different countries. For example, sometimes you are in England, sometimes you are in India in your syllabus, sometimes, sometimes you are in Poland. With all these, we say that you get kind of paradigm shift your paradigm is shifted with the readings, with the experience you get in this syllabus. This drama takes you to Japan. Kinoshita is a Japanese playwright and had been having kind of interest regarding English theater. In Japan, English theater was not really popular, but Kinoshita gets a challenge, kind of revolutionary challenge in, uh, in presenting this drama. Um, associating a very popular folk tale, a folk tale. This had been a folk tale, right? So in this folk tale, uh, we find a lot of folk elements, sometimes fantasy elements. This is well connected to Japanese culture, Japanese pastoral culture, so that he identifies something which is universal in this particular folk tale, and he transforms that folk tale into a drama. So that, let me share my PowerPoint. Twilight of a Crane. Usually I believe uh, as a life skill, we have to study the story of the book, that's true, but rather than that, once you get a book to your hand, Suppose that you get this book to your hand, all right? Suppose that you're in a library, otherwise you're in a bookshop. Uh, the preliminary study of a literary text begins with that particular first meeting of the book. So if I were you, I would go to a bookshop and I would take this book to my hand. I would read the title of the book first. And after that, I will be attracted towards a cover page and its colors, otherwise the, 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 the texture of the book is also very important. Sometimes I smell the book and see whether the book tastes good. So uh, I, had a, I had a kind of a practice all those days to turn the back cover, otherwise we call it the blurb and read the blurb and get a kind of an idea what this book would be talking about. So take it, I mean, make it a life skill. So this is not the only literary text that you're going to meet in your life. Sometimes you will you'll be directed to advanced level literature. Otherwise, you'll be learning uh, in, in your secondary, tertiary levels. You'll be learning literature. Otherwise, you'll be experiencing literature as a kind of a, a hobby. There, I advise you to think about these strategies of learning a literary text. Studying the topic is very important. So let me introduce this topic, Twilight of a Crane. First, let's discuss about these two words, two content words, like first one is Twilight, the second one is Crane. So I needed to write down them and think about what does the term Twilight say? What does the term Crane say? They have a weight. Without thinking, without thinking twice, a literarian would not name it his or her literary text. 
and he always suggests a literary text is almost like a doorway to the literary, I mean, the content of the text. So that's kind of prediction that you can make after studying the text. Let's take these two terms separately, twilight and the crane. First take twilight. It's kind of very common, right? You all are very familiar with the topic twilight. It's kind of time of day, okay, time of day. And it is like a transformation from day to night. Transformation, transformation from day to night. And again, it's, it's suggestive of transformation of light to darkness. Further, we can symbolically evaluate it as uh, a transformation from something good to something bad. So in our Sri Lankan culture, in Sri Lankan culture, we have uh, different notions about the term twilight. Uh, usually we call it gommana. And we usually believe that gommana kiyane ke honda de akne me ke yaka inna. Likewise, when I was a child that I rather used to hear these sort of uh, stories, sometimes even mythical stories. I actually did not want to evaluate what myth associated with that term, but I sometimes I did not like that. I did not like twilight when I was a child. I'm re referring to my own experience. Uh, before, I mean, the, the, the light, of course, I enjoyed. Darkness also I enjoyed. I, I really love darkness, but I did not like this transformative time. So, in the world literary arena also, we know twilight has become one of the very popular terms. Now, in movies, you young people enjoy like Twilight Saga. You find the term twilight and you find something critical, something eerie going on in twilight. So to summarize, twilight is a transformation of something from this to the other. Basically, it is from light to darkness. And twilight is a transformation from uh, something good to something critical. This term is another very important term in the poem. What is a poem that this, uh, this particular term uh, becomes one of the important terms? To the evening star. Into the evening star also we discuss about the term twilight. So keep that preserved in your mind. I'm going to move on to the next one, crane. Crane, symbol. Birds become symbolic, right? Birds become symbolic in literature. So how do you think that birds become symbolic in literature? And again, we know that different countries hail different sort of birds. Some countries believe that peacock is kind of a sacred bird. In Sri Lanka, when it comes to down south, Kataragam area, we know that Kataragam de Yange Vahane Kielakienoa Monara. So that we venerate it. We have a kind of veneration. We don't sometimes kill. We don't try to kill peacocks. We have kind of veneration, sacred feeling towards that. But when it comes to the crane, of course, we don't have that much of sacred uh, evaluation about this bird in the Sri Lankan context. However, when you turn your attention to Japan, if you just Google and see, in Japan, crane becomes a very important sacred, otherwise a cultural symbol in Japan. The color of the crane, color of the typical crane, red, black, white, are mostly compared with Japanese uh, national colors as well. And again, usually when they go for weddings, otherwise when they rather give present to marry, present to people who marry, sometimes they make paper cranes using origami and they present that crane to the couple. They wish sophistication, good luck, goodwill, uh, uh, symbolically offering that particular crane. Thus I say, crane becomes a sacred symbol in Japan. Crane, they say that crane is kind of national emblem of Japan. So guys, think about this. Japan, crane, twilight. When we amalgamate all these two concepts, we come across uh, we identify something very important. What is that? Try to amalgamate these two uh, uh, vocabulary pieces of vocabulary. They are not 
pieces of vocabulary, just pieces of vocabulary, because we started adding weight to these two terms. We, had, we added more connotations to these two terms. So think about that. Then twilight of a crane. If twilight is a transformation, if crane symbolizes Japan, can we say that it is transformation of Japan? Can we predict that it is of Japan's transformation from something sacred, something good to something critical? Can I say that it is a transformation of Japan from light to critical darkness? Kinoshita had many notions regarding this. Therefore, I need you to think about the topic. Topic is very important, right? We never expect that the topic would be a question, but uh, you are familiar with this particular question. I think uh, I discussed uh, that in the previous video connected to the bear. The bear by Anton Chekhov. The bear, the title, and how it is parallel to the characters involved in this drama, in that drama. So believe in that, I'm rather, I mean, make it a practice, make it a life skill, and try to think how the topic is going to be parallel to the plot line, the story that we are going to learn. There can be very important thematic suggestions in the topic. Therefore, think about Twilight of a Crane as an important topic and how it suggests the storyline as well. The vocabulary certain vocabulary that we discussed just a while ago, transition, transition, transition from something to someone, like good era to bad era, otherwise from bad to good, transition, transformation. And the third word is also very familiar with you, I think, interregnum. What is that? It is a kind of interval between two eras like uh, we'll say twilight, okay? Day, night, and there's kind of a gap between that. This is kind of interregnum. Now, uh, suppose that one government finds its, finds its end and another government starts a, a new era. In between time is a little bit of a silence. It has kind of a silence, right? In that, that particular time can be nominated as interregnum, okay? So in this drama also we find interregnum, like the term twilight, the light, the darkness, the transformative time, otherwise this particular inter interval can be called interregnum. And term inversion, inversion is also kind of transformation. So learn this vocabulary because uh, more vocabulary always you know, can make your answers shine out from the others. Strong vocabulary, strong vocabulary, but only necessary ones. Don't try to overload your answers with, uh, you say complex words. Complex words always do not suggest a complex answer. That's a myth students have. Sometimes they find 10, 15 words and they try to include them in answers. Uh, sometimes haphazardly, sometimes they repeat the same term. They find a new word and they keep on repeating that. That uh, gives kind of an artificial appearance to the answer. So in, I always believe if I find a new word, I have to use that word for five, six months, perhaps one year to make it my own word. Otherwise, if I fi accidentally find a word and include that in answers, uh, the examiners can also understand that this person does not have that much of idea regarding that. Because... A word is very important. It has many facets. So if you do not understand all the facets, sometimes you use them in wrong contexts. Think about that as well. So you always can Google and find out what meanings do these words provide? Do you think that this word can be used at this place? Okay. Now, uh, a blessing that we got in COVID season was uh, the learner that you were inside was found. Right, the time that we rather had kind of interval at home because of the COVID season, because of long silences, long disconnection from the outer world, we had uh, time to identify the learner, which was rather 
you know, dancing in you sometimes. You did not, you never saw that particular learner. Now we all know how to learn. All those days we had a kind of a concept that the teacher should be there, student should be there, teacher teaches, a kind of politic in that, right? But here we find sometimes you come to the class well armored with more knowledge than the teacher. Suppose that I go to a class, sometimes I find, uh, yeah, students are much more better, much far more better uh, in that particular context rather than me all one. Because most of you have identified the learner in you. Therefore, I suggest you try to hunt vocabulary and try to use them. Try to use them often. Okay, try to include them in a day-to-day -day, day -day speaking, otherwise they did writing. Then after a long time, like the word becomes your own word. Then sometimes after five, six months, like when you include that vocabulary, the examiner might feel, ah, this person has good vocabulary. Okay, so have that message as well. I'm going to uh, move into the next slide. Japan. Japan is the context in this video, in, in this uh, uh, drama. So Japan becomes the central setting of this play. So it's our duty to identify what, why Japan? What is Japan? Where is Japan? What happened to Japan? Uh, especially in the 20th century, 20th century, even in the 21st century, uh, Japan had been going through many uh, hardships, many ups and downs. And again, we know that Japan uh, faced critical, critical conflicts. Sometimes the other countries of the world never faced. You most of you are familiar with this Hiroshima and Nagasaki incidents. In 1940s, you can see the see the picture here. Uh, Japan rather got smashed into ashes and pieces. <clears throat> so the problem is this: even though the world had, I mean, even at the World War, Japan uh, uh, Japan got diminished. Actually, it's not a problem. It's kind of a very positive thing. Japan got diminished into pieces, but Jap very same Japan could stand back. They showed their power of coming back. They showed their power of uh, rebuilding their nation with kind of a better attitude, better physical appearance, all right? Better, better emotional control. So therefore, I say that destruction can always rather suggest kind of a, a construction as well. So Japan had been a very good example. Japan is a very good example as well. So Kinoshita attempts to include these particular notions under currently in the story, Twilight of a Crane. However, he does not want to directly suggest them with ages, years, exact uh, you know, concepts, he uses symbols, perhaps he uses symbols and he is attempting to suggest this sort of a Japan had been there. Now its transformation had happened. Now Japan is something different. So let me move. Let me share this with you. Focus on the transformation of Japan. Listen to the sounds. Look at the colors. And try your level best to focus on the appearance of the Japan before the war. In the latter part of the video, you may experience how Japan came to be the country that we all see now. Okay.
doors on the left side. Okay, I think you have got a slight idea regarding <clears throat> how Japan got transformed into the Japan that we see now. Again, I need you to uh, evaluate this video uh, and see the juxtaposition, how these two ideas are uh, put side by side by this video, juxtaposed, old Japan and new Japan are put together in this video juxtaposed. So let's see. The greenery, the sound of the stream, the sound of birds is not heard in this particular artificial society. This is pure nature. This is artificial nature that man has created. This gives kind of soothing attitude but this does not give a soothing attitude. But we obviously know this is not what we call development. The physical development people always believe. This is not the materialistic development people believe. Greenery and calm and quiet attitude, slow rhythm, innocent rhythm of life. This is not ever believed to be the development, materialistic development by people. Modern man always believes that this must be the development. So, so I'm going to take you to this discussion now. So in the video also you found two, uh, two uh, colors of Japan juxtapose, juxtapose, J-U-X-T-A-P-O-S-E, right? Two things are put together. Then when they are put together, when they are close, we can see the contrast. What are the two things juxtaposed in that video? We found it was pre-war Japan and the other one was post-war Japan. Pre-war Japan means Japan, before the war, before the Second World War, basically. Uh, Post-war Japan means after 1945, after Japan, I mean, after the war. Now, I don't know whether you are familiar with the, with the two wars, two world wars that we encountered in the 20th century. This is for your uh, kind of extra knowledge. First World War took place in 1914. 1914, it ran up to 1970. Second World War it officially started in 1930s, 39s, obviously, and it ran up to 1945. Like, So we wasted many of the validity of having kind of free life in the world, mainly because of two world wars, the whole world involved in that. So Kinoshita <clears throat> sees a tragedy of the transformation of people transformation of attitude, emotions of people, nature-based life of people up, I mean, unto the life that we experience now, uh, thought of, you know, selecting a folk tale which can, which can assist that particular idea and presents a drama called Twilight of a Crane. Let's examine the qualities of Prevo Japan. Prevo Japan, as you saw, in the video, it was blended with nature. We found greenery and people lived in greenery, people loved greenery, and uh, people rather enjoyed the inspiration they received from nature. So in our life also, in our life sometimes, you know, we are having kind of very artificial life, but we try our level best to keep a little plant at home. Sometimes it can be a plastic one, right? You like to see that greenery. Otherwise, a plastic flower. We, we know that we are rather connected. We are connected to nature. So we can't rather move away from that. Therefore, we invite nature to our own uh, domestic environments as well. It had been kind of, a in, kind of an instinct that human being had. 
because we lived in nature we are part and parcel in nature we are inextricably connected to nature how many of you have that experience when you go to a forest otherwise kind of a reserve you don't feel like you know coming back as well even though that is little harsh than harsher than the lifestyle that you live here in your own home area with air conditions some sometimes fans uh, sometimes cushion mattresses and all rather than that we enjoy that because our body the human instinct says that we are part of nature and economy in pre war japan was basically agricultural we all know that we start with agriculture right then they had innocent lifestyle innocent attitudes they were not rather hypocritic and mostly relationships are unconditional it, when they start a relationship they never expected something in return to that okay i do something for someone i do not expect in return for, for the things that i do for that person so that even i had a life like that when i was uh, when i was little when i was like you perhaps uh, when i was in a, I, i was a kind of 80 man so in 80s like we had kind of these sort of unconditional relationships in villages sometimes adults ask me to come and puta wada bada ginida kiyala kanna deepu avasta natte mane sometimes uh, we find people like that in the in this world as well but sometimes we know we have a kind of a quizy bro if someone is attempted to help suppose that i stop my car and ask one of you to come and uh, one of i ask one of you can i give a lift to you puta then you'll be having kind of a question in your mind why do you think that this man is doing this for me is he expecting any profit under this you little ones have been kind of uh, i say that it is kind of uh, given kind of practice in thinking like that no one helps without expecting profit everybody has an idea of getting profit back so uh, the pre war japan kinoshita so was unconditional and they were self sufficient they had everything they had they wanted therefore they were contented contentment contentment is very important in life right otherwise you always cry for something that you have not got okay you have a car but you need two cars you cry your cry for that sometimes you eat and you cry for more so lack of contentment i have seen young people like that lack of contentment always keeps you with unrest you keep on planning keep on trying and you rather you do not find calm and quiet serene attitude in you you always try to get something you run you are you on a rat race like rats run when one per, one rat runs the others follow sometimes they don't rather question why the first one is running okay they don't stop and ask uh, from the other person are you angry hungry are you tired no we just right we just run so in a life like this we find that lack of contentment always makes our lives uneasy but kinoshita suggests that old japan and was pre war japan had this contentment they were happy with what they had got then love we know we discuss about love uh, providing different aspects to that in many of the literary texts in our syllabus the very best example is the nightingale and the rose a timely selection for young people sometimes uh, when i was young i never knew the categories of love love is l o v e on the walls in the bathroom on the wall of the classroom we were so i mean we we could find them right we were so excited to see love on the wall but people who follow literature uh, get a golden opportunity to examine what love is and we categorize it we sometimes you know uh, go further go deep in that particular idea and we try to find categories of love so there we find spiritual love is there we love conditional love sorry we we find conditional love we find unconditional love unrequited love parental love love of adults love of uh, children love of uh, uh, the the brothers and sisters so this is kind of a multifaceted sort of a term. love is kind of an umbrella term we have a lot it is multifaceted multi areas are there connected to that so 
Kinoshita finds old Japan was spiritual. The when love was spiritual. When love is spiritual, there is uh, no reason for 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 two people to get separated. They never value about the things, that, the money that they have. They never value about the look. They never value about the car. The otherwise that okay, either thing that to go on a balan ne. So you love the person spiritually. Then the next point is, it was family oriented. Family was a unit. Family was a unit, and it was kind of traditional unit as well. Nowadays, we find that people do not like to have a family. There are people who marry and they say, "I don't. We don't want to have children." Do we like to proceed like that? If we have children, that we can't rather demand the economy that we are going through now. Okay, you all know what capitalism means. Money oriented society. If you want to go to the climax level, perima level of uh, 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 capitalism, family is a trouble for some people. They say, if I never married, I could earn more. But Kinoshita suggests old Japan had family. In most of the Japanese uh, folk tales, we find it is family. They suggest family, and I think that you are familiar with uh, the. Tele series Oshin, apa yang kali apa itu maha visale itu cartoon, loko dewal ti bunen eh, then apa itu sara sati kita sara ek Oshin ni, ni apa itu balag ni inna until Oshin comes. So we really enjoyed that, right? We they, all those days we really enjoyed the lifestyle, the courage of resilience of that Japanese girl, and we rather watched it until that she became a grandmother, kind of an old woman. How she went through all these, she started her life. Uh, In a village, pastoral area. Ultimately, she moves to. Otherwise, she develops up to kind of capitalistic uh, personality. We enjoyed that in that. Manghitani YouTube bati. If you feel like you know, you can just watch it. And we found democracy in families as well. What is this family democracy? Everybody had the same uh, power in the family. It's not that the father has the power. Otherwise, mother has the power. Sometimes you know. You overpower mother and father. Perhaps there can be examples like that, right? I never believe uh, a politic in a family. Politic means one overpowers the other. Would bring happiness and peace. It always keeps everybody uneasy. So in old Sri Lanka as well, we found that mother, father, children had kind of divided duty, divided responsibility. I know South Asia had kind of known history for male dominance. Father dominates the family, okay. But they really believe that it, yeah, father sometimes dominates the family. But he realizes it, and uh, he, everybody realizes, and they move in the life. But now we find because of dominance, democ lack of dom democracy in families, tempt people to separation, right? So then we go to the next level, honesty. Honesty is golden. I always believe in that, and genuine nature, genuine nature. If someone smiles with you, with I mean, having a genuine smile. If it is a genuine smile, you all can understand. Even a sixteen-year-old, fifteen-year-old can understand whether the person is genuine or not, because you are adolescents. You are not an adult. You are not a child. You are adolescents. Adolescents have been given kind of uh, instinct to understand whether this person is correct or not. Sometimes you don't use it. That's a problem. So generous, I'm sorry, honesty and genuine nature of people are noted in old Japan. Okay, Kinoshita really wanted to highlight them. Then we'll move on to the next level, post-war Japan. What are the qualities that the writer contrasts? Otherwise, that we contrast uh, when we juxtapose pre-war Japan to post-war Japan. It was blended with nature, but here we find industry-oriented. We can't avoid that, right? Industrialization started overpowering, otherwise gobbling up the agricultural economy in the world. It happened in Sri Lanka as well. We discuss about that. Martin Wickramasinghe, the writer in Sri Lanka, one of the prominent writers in Sri Lanka, discusses uh, that theory in his trilogy. Dampereliya, Kaliyogiya Yugante. We experience that. How agricultural community, upper class community, fall off in Sri Lanka. Similarly, Kinoshita attempts to show that Japan had a transformation. Japan got transformed from agriculture to industry. Now you can have kind of picture 
how do you draw and how do you do, draw an agricultural uh, setting what sort of colors do you think that you have to have in your palette mostly you find green right mostly you find blue but if you draw an industrial background you need black ash sometimes brown sometimes deep colors right so these are imagery you should get in your mind when i say blended with nature and industry oriented so next is mostly people are hypocritical hypocritic what do you mean by hypocrisy <clears throat> if you want to have kind of extra note on the term hypocrisy you can note down hypocrisy uh, uh, is given a dictionary meaning in this way hypocritic person says something and does something else that is one uh, requirement to identify that one criteria to identify hypocritic person he says something and he does something else second he doesn't want to have want he doesn't want others to have what he has he doesn't want others to have what he has just for example okay i have a car i don't want others to buy cars i'm so jealous otherwise i'm so competitive about uh, that particular theory then i say no i don't like when others have it otherwise you do something to avoid them the third is you don't want others to have what you don't have you don't have a car they have cars so you're so jealous about that otherwise you are you do something to destroy them so i say i repeat you say something and do something else next you don't want others to have what you don't have third you don't want others to have what you have what you don't have they come with i think that you understand it right so when i rather repeat when i tell these call these uh, when when i explain these uh, pieces of vocabulary i think you are reminded of certain characters in the drama just think about that as well and as i said relationships are Uh, i said relationships work uh, unconditional in pre war japan now in the modern japan in even in the modern world if i consider it as a whole we find conditional relationships we usually do not do uh, anything if we do not gain anything yeah, i don't say that everybody is in the same boat there are many rather there are many people who have kind of different notions connected to this one they are rather radical they don't like to uh, fall into that particular mud okay then uh, new society post war japan they are not self sufficient sometimes because of open economy sometimes we stop uh, manufacturing certain things because we can bring them from outside now we experience it in sri lanka peradika dhanya garata pitting hal gena then we can't say that we are self sufficient there right therefore we have to identify this very very importantly okay when you are not self sufficient you go to unrest when you are not self sufficient you depend on others and you get lot of desires when you are not sufficient and you are uncontented to the uncontented to the maximum okay you are not satisfied lack of satisfaction otherwise no satisfaction always always keeps you uh, keeps you at a risk you are restless then materialistic love in post war japan love is materialistic what do you mean by materialistic so if one day you start a relationship if you rather depend on the person's outlook ah he is very handsome so i fall in love with that person so what does that mean you fall in love with that person's materialistic belly the money the person has the car sha that person has a posh car so i should fall in love with it ah he is a he is a he is having kind of good profession right it's professionally accepted in the society that's something critical right all these things fall into uh, fall into kind of materialistic facet nowadays in sri lanka also we find marriages become uh failures because of this flat decisions people get for example uh i just wanted to take the mangala then we in tiru uh in newspapers and just see what do they expect do they expect people to have good hearts good emotions good manners good education 
sometimes good education but not always good uh, manners good emotions uh, good self control honesty genuine nature we can't rather find people uh, 100% uh, we can't find people with 100% uh, accuracy and all but at least we do we search my question is that do we search no we just mention all the materialistic things in that so it becomes kind of a critical point in this drama as well i'll be coming to that less family oriented gender dominance is seen in this play also we find characters stay democratic at the beginning ultimately we find the latter part we find characters change they start dominating others then honesty and genuine nature in post war japan is questionable so that community questions whether this person is genuine or honest so kinoshita had a duty to include all these all these contrasting details connected to pre war japan and post war japan list of characters it's obvious right you have crammed this and you know this and you are very familiar with the with the list of characters but you are obvious that the, the examiner examiner will never ask you to rather list the characters right therefore uh, i would like to tell you something very important i will introduce these characters and i will add weight to these characters and i will discuss about how these characters become symbolic in the play how these characters represent something that kinoshita saw in his society i take that uh, table back pre war japan and post war japan i need you to think a little and think about the characters think about this table and try to uh, fix characters try to import characters and fix them in the correct column for example out of the characters you find in the drama who is blended with nature who is agricultural innocent unconditional contented spiritual in love and family oriented democratic honest genuine it's obvious right you can i know that there's a character in your mind and what characters would be parallel to post war japan example there are characters who are industry oriented hypocrite conditional in relationships uncontented materialistic and not family oriented not genuine not honest so then i think you have started thinking about those characters giving it an idea of representation example one character represents something something that we can see in the society thus these characters represent children children's character represent what part of the society what part of the uh, society that we discuss in the story it is pre war japan okay all the qualities are connected to children then what about uh, zodo unzu mostly zodo falls into post war japan because of the hypocritic unconditional <clears throat> character qualities then zu i will leave yo yo a little zu obviously zu falls into uh, pre war japan zu is a very good example <clears throat> solid example to represent pre war japan then what about yo yo what about yo yo yeah in one of the previous discussions one of the students directly said that yes yo yo represents all these three qualities one pre war japan two transformation of japan parivartane three transform japan we know he had been innocent we had know that he had been family oriented we know that he was honest honest he loved nature he loved the family and loved children and uh, quite honest and genuine and unconditional uh, in love with zu but in the latter part in the, in the middle of the drama we find that he starts transforming with the interaction with sodo and unzu okay 
after that we find a person who is totally transformed into a person who is hypocritic money minded uh, conditional uh, decisions are there in relationships with all these we can say that he is transformed to a person like sodo and unso as well then yoyo inasan and yoyo displays prevo japan's qualities then the transformation of japan is shown after that and transform japan is also displayed with him therefore i can say that yoyo's character develops yoyo's character develops yoyo might be the representation of the tragedy that japan experienced in the 20th century okay i think that you understand the uh, symbolic values of these characters i'm going to discuss them further then the next is senba ori senba ori as yeah it's kind of central symbol in the drama especially in theater we find central symbols mostly in sen- i mean drama we find central symbols shakespeare was good at that shakespeare was good at that in uh, in shakespeare's othello we find a handkerchief as a symbol so we find a lot right so uh, shinoshita decides to have a central symbol and he includes that central symbol in the play giving it kind of a serious uh, complexity therefore i would like to call this uh, senba ori is not a flat symbol it is a dynamic symbol dynamic symbol symbol a symbol that changes from person to person when so interacts with senba ori it gives a different idea when children are juxtaposed with senba ori that idea is rather different okay for example what do you think about sodo and unsu and what do you think how sodo and unsu see senba ori they see senba ori just as money purely this money for them children they never consider senbori as uh, as money right uh, they don't value it right they don't see the value of it as well just think about this your little brother sister at home sees a 5000 rupee note on the floor what would he be doing he would pick it up tear it tear that into pieces perhaps put it into mouth and chew okay but what would you think that your mother would be doing she would perhaps hit the brother sister take the 5000 rupee out and uh, try it paste it again and would go to a bank and take uh, take sometimes it will be exchanged to a pure note so mother knows the value of it mother sees 5000 as money value but children do not ever see uh, things as money okay they never uh, would think twice to throw your mother's if your mother has a diamond necklace they would sometimes crush it and throw it away they never see the value of it so senbori acts and reacts to people in different ways so let's see children and senbori they never value senbori as money they see zero value in senbori i think i have made a little mistake here please make sure that you correct it there's a kind of typing error sodo and unsu sodo and unsu always believe that senbori is money don't ever write this one act of love gratitude and sacrifice that is not there sodo and unsu always believe that it is money then su su sees senbori as act of love it's act of gratitude as well because uh yo yo helped her the crane was uh, shot crane was having a serious life between life and death life that life so that yo yo helped her therefore said she had gratitude to help yo uh, yo therefore she weaves in bauri with her own blood and flesh like then it's kind of a sacrifice as well because she's rather uh, weaving it with her own blood and flesh right she she sacrifices her life for that you can obviously see it in the latter part of the drama 
she becomes thin and she is unable to walk properly as well a rickety walk because she never thought of you know sacrificing her life to fulfill the request of yoyo okay so that su and senba ori become rather very suggestive in the play then what about yoyo it's very important to note yoyo and senba ori yoyo believes senba ori as gift of love gift that he receives so, uh, to come uh, to uh, rather compensate his gratitude otherwise it was kind of a sacrifice gift of sacrifice given by his love that is in the first half of the drama in the second half of the drama the very same senba ori becomes a point of conflict point of conflict means a prashne ati vena hetu point of conflict right senba ori creates a point of conflict in othello uh, there's a symbol called othello by shakespeare uh, a symbol called handkerchief handkerchief becomes one point of conflict in the play because of that the problem takes place right therefore i say senba ori acts with yoyo and the second part of his life second step of his life we find he takes senba ori as a point of conflict he needs we so to weave the cloth i need you to highlight that dialogue in uh, on page 56 he says weave the cloth right away and a relationship had been unconditional at the beginning right if you can rather take the book and see uh, he uses he overuses the term sweet heart my love my love sweet heart epa vena kama wage ya eka pavichi karna but on page 56 57 like we find that he he changes his language we find weave the cloth right away with an exclamation mark weave means it's an imperative it's a command the beautiful language of yoyo very loving ardent language of yoyo now you can see it is changed reason is senbari weave the cloth if you can't if you say that you can't i will let you go if the term if is a conditional sentence this is the first time we identify the term if in yoyo's language i need you to think about as central quotations they are very important right such quotations can be very useful that you can include at many of the questions actually think about the central quotation is very important right plays a major role as well it's very very important for you right so uh, then the third part third part of yoyo's life we find the very senba ori who which had been gift of love gratitude and sacrifice now becomes point to regret he becomes sad about his life sad about what happened to his relationship with zu uh, sad about zu's fate as well because of senbari he regrets he hugs them and cries he never want he never wanted the uh, zodo and unsu to come back and take the two clothes the drama ended like that actually it's kind of abrupt end, uh, ending sudden ending uh, the the uh, the drama artist the playwright doesn't want us to know whether he uh, uh, he offered the close to uh, uh, soda nonsu but it is suggested that he is hugging the clothes it says that perhaps he would not give the clothes right because he is he has already realized what is truth in life right he has realized who is more important than the money otherwise the money that they can i mean he can get uh, after selling senbari this is one reality that we all come on one day okay one day you realize money in your pocket cannot do anything sometimes even today's society you have money but you can't buy things at your own wish i never say that money is not needed think about this facet as well money is needed <clears throat> this is one question i saw in one of the provincial papers practicality of the central theme of uh, twilight of a crane so no money no money and only love yeah that idea is very good very pleasing very pleasing to the uh, 
please into here as well and please please into see as well but however can we live like that everything is money you know how education becomes money it has become one of the best mafias in the world then what about medicine can you go to a private hospital and cry and say i don't have money please treat me no they don't do it then think about i mean try to strike a balance between these two if you get a question like that okay practicality of this sort of a question I mean, sort of a theme yeah we need not we don't have money money is very great yes we identify that but on the other hand uh obviously money is needed for needed for uh, needed to move on in your life in the 21st century as well that you have to rather balance that theory and right so think about this my discussion is diverted to the character development now what are the dynamic characters what are the static characters i know you students know the difference between dynamic characters and static characters dynamic characters in a play in a literary text show change show development but critically in some articles they say that that development can be upward development character stays uh we'll say uh, i don't know uh, the tamil students would understand this but uh, if you search you can identify that in buddhism we find uh, angulimala katha he had lot of dynamics right he he started like this he went up to he was down in uh, ethics becomes a killer ultimately he finds reality in life so he finds kind of up, upgraded kind of development on the other hand uh, certain characters are they start their life as kind of heroes uh, kings ultimately we find their downfall is eminent and uh, unco- eminent and it happens uh, um, having no other uh, other control as well right it is i mean that the downfall is controlled by sometimes fate like in othello like in macbeth we find um, othello by shakespeare i was talking about that if you are quite interested in that you can just search uh, he finds he is as he is presented as a general very strong loyal person to the country ultimately we find he his downfall is uh, presented in the drama it could not be controlled by anyone so such characters are dynamic and static characters means characters that retain on the parallel line they never change they start uh some character qualities and they end up with the similar character qualities now what are the dynamic characters what are the static characters we identify in this drama it's obvious when you walk back it's obvious yoyo's character become becomes a dynamic character because he changes in the previous discussion we discussed about he displays the qualities of pre war japan transformation of japan and post war japan and further in this level also we find he when he is connected to senba ari the central symbol of the play he shows these three developments these three rather qualities time to time in his life therefore i can rather justify joyo's character is a dynamic character that kinoshita includes in his play what are the other character why dynamic characters in one of the answers of one of the students i rec- recognize this particular judgment it was really strong he had written that uh, su is also dynamic character su comes to this world as a pure uncorrupted woman pure uncorrupted woman okay that she is blend she is uh, kind of she is symbol of nature we all know that uncorrupted nature uh but ultimately so realizes there are hypocritic people at the beginning she displays that she never understands what sodo and unsu speak he she says that i never understand their language i never understand their language what do you mean by their language in the story they speak english but their language means language of money sometimes you know you have this particular experience with your life with your life sometimes with your adults as well they speak about money business getting profit and rather having a competition in this particular business world you little ones have kind of confusion why i mean what are they talking about even going on a trip like they discuss about money profit uh, 
competition of capitalistic world and all, then you feel better stay at home rather than coming in, rather listening to this uh, uh, talk that we don't understand. It is perhaps Sinhala, it is perhaps Tamil, it is perhaps English. But why don't you understand that? Because you are not in that context, right? You rather enjoy it. Sometimes you uh, have a swim and enjoy, otherwise run on a lawn and you enjoy that. But you don't like that language, right? So obviously, and so recurrently says, I don't understand their language. And in the latter part, he complains. There's a complaint towards Yo-Yo. He says, Yo-Yo, now you speak their language. What is their language? Language which is infected with the capitalistic terms. So you can understand. So realizes this and so, so self-realization ultimately prompts her to leave this world. Comes like this and ends up like this. She realizes it and she runs away. Otherwise flies away. She knows that she's not, uh, not a match to this particular uh, ambiguous capitalistic world. Therefore, I can say that uh, Su Tu can be considered as a dynamic character. But obviously, Sodo becomes a contrast. Sodo never becomes a dynamic character. He starts like this, ends up like this. Very parallel line that he travels. We see, even at the last moment, he says, we are happy that we have got two clothes. I'm happy that I have got two clothes. That do you think that he's worried about the family, the relationship that they rather tarnished just a while ago? They destroyed the relationship. And so is flying. So is flying away. He notices that as well, but his attention is towards Senbari. So these sort of experiences are prevalent in the society. We can find them everywhere in the society. Okay. Sometimes you should not be worried about them. When you rather study them, study these dramas, when you rather get these sort of people and their characterization and all, when you meet them, you will not be worried about them in the future. That is something really important to know in your life. You see, ah, yeah, they are, they are. So they are like Sodo. So I should not be worried about them. They never understand what I say. I never understand what they say as well. So you can just uh, diplomatically forget about what they say. It's kind of a development, right? It's kind of life skill you learn from this drama. So uh, I finalize it. So don't ever cares about uh, what happens to that family. He cares about uh, money, right? And what about Unsu? In certain articles, I see Unsu shows a bit of development. Unsu at the latter part is worried about the destruction of the family. Worried about uh, Zoo when she appears as kind of a thin woman after weaving two clothes. But he's not able to sympathize with Yo-Yo's and Zoo's relationship because Sodo overpowers and controls. This is something common in the capitalistic world. Okay. Uh, gullible ones. G-U-L-L-I-B-L-E. Gullible ones. Who are uncritically accepting whatever other people say. In single, we call it Lanu Kana, Moda, Kianika. Gullible ones are manipulated in capitalistic world, money oriented world. Yo yo becomes a gullible personality. So that can also be one question, right? Yo yo is a gullible personality, but Su never becomes a gullible woman. Su understands, right? Su understands something wrong is going on with these people. So she realizes it and she flies away ultimately, right? I always believe that Su is a principled woman principled woman she rather she says and she does it and she doesn't want to change her uh, principles and jump into corruption like okay so if you analyze those character you can say that she's a principled woman and she never wants to live with this corruption again okay then i say uh, what are the other gullible characters Yo yo, and what about uh, Unsu? Unsu stays gullible with this Sodo because there's kind of micro politic. You know what politic means? I discussed that in the previous video as well. Politics is of two types macro politics and micro politics. 
macro politics is very popular you all are very familiar with that macro political level like party politics elections uh, candidates votes parliament ministers president and all these fall into that and political theorem theory they fall into macro politics uh, what is micro politics it is everywhere you can see it everywhere right suppose so i ask my students to sit and listen what i say is also kind of politic i exercise my control on you right the control of the father on you control of father, uh, mother on you otherwise control of mother on the father father on the mother otherwise we'll say you control your uh, pet i see some yeah some children they cut hair of dogs and they put uh, ribbons and sometimes they color the dogs innocent dog stays innocent dog is paralyzed like that you decorate it right so there we find uh, there is politic on that in jungle we find politics in the poem uh, breakfast you find gender politics husband and wife's politics and you find it in uh, farewell to barn and stack entry one kills the other murderer otherwise victim and culprit uh, politic and in the way we find nature how nature uh, overpowers the power of human and uh, in uh, yeah in to the evening star the poem suggests that particular idea innocent is uh, at threat in front of evil wolf lion okay so you can understand that particular idea micro politics then here also we find micro politics like sodo overpowers punso then at the beginning yo yo and zo did not have kind of politic right they were democ they were having kind of similar powers ogula da matakana so cooks and yo yo says i will also cook for you okay cold soup is no good for my sweetheart so what does that mean that they share their responsibilities both are accountable for their family matters okay then what will happen if that happens in your own own home front early in the morning the father gets up and makes tea and uh, offers that to the mother him family see no that thing but in general we don't find that particular you know kind of uh, kind of uh, behaviors in sri lankan male uh, i don't rather admire that it should be kind of uh, shared duty your mother will look at and say ah why go look where you are doing are you not well if the father does something like that because it's kind of strange right but this this is an advice that you should get to your life i always say that literature is not a subject it's a life skill so even after studying all these all these you know relationships you find in many of the literary texts you select a wrong person to marry is something disastrous you can get an a pass right but if you can decide with whom you are going to rather have your life how i mean which friend that you are going to select which husband which wife will be selected if you get that sort of analysis i personally believe that you have achieved the objective of the subject aramuna of the subject therefore think about them okay politics micro politics we identify in the play what may be they say topics so basically you expect this sort of discussion from me but i'm really good at not guessing questions i don't like that so if you cover up almost all the areas you should be able to pick a question and write that is what is expected right this is not a very big syllabus right so i will be anyway giving kind of uh, um assistance to you what sort of question areas can come okay so some questions can be directed towards characterization we know yo yo's characterization can come if you discuss about yo yo you have lot now in my discussion i was talking about how yo yo represented three eras of uh, japan like pre transformation and post war japan and discussed about how yo yo uh, interacts with senba ori okay and yeah you can rather talk about how politics work in his relationship how democratic he had been now he is he is overpowering the woman he becomes kind of dominant one and you can understand how he realizes uh, 
uh, that he was wrong and he realizes a value of a relationship rather than money. With all this, you can discuss about Sue's character. I mean, Yo-Yo's character. So, yeah, as we discuss, he do become, she too becomes a dynamic character. And uh, we can say that Sue is a kind of mixture of nature and human. So we ha have a technical term for that. If you want, you can write down that. Symbiosis. S-Y-M-B-I-O-S-I-S. Symbiosis means mixture of nature and human. Uh, there are mythical mythical beasts, mythical creatures uh, that we can see in our mythology and as classical literature. Man, uh, nature are juxtaposed. Otherwise, head is man's, body is somebody, I mean, some animals. Okay, but we don't find that one here. We find kind of transformation of woman, right? Okay, Tra she transforms herself, you know, uh, to uh, crane and it happens on the other way around, right? So you can write about them. And Sue's realization about uh, how she does not match with the society that she stays with. As a principal woman, now again, I tell you, if you feel that this society, otherwise the, the, so the society that you live in is not suitable for you. You feel uneasy for that. You feel, yeah, what they talk is, uh, what they're talking about is not really for me. I don't really enjoy what they speak. I don't really, uh, I don't really like what they do. So, as a principled human being, what you should do is to leave the place. You should not rather uh, go for hard times with people. You should not fight with people. It's if it goes against your conscience and rather opinions, conscience and opinions, you should rather quit the place and move away. So, what so does is that. Then you can write about Sue in that way and you can associate all the pre-war Japanese qualities, post-war Japanese qualities as well when you draw characterization of these. So at the beginning, I discuss about how unconditional, conditional, all these are connect, uh, the, the qualities of pre-war Japan and post-war Japan. Remember them as central information to the drama. All these characters can also be characterized along with those two elements, pre-war Japanese qualities of pre-war Japan and qualities of post-war Japan. Then we can talk about Sodo and Unsu, right? We know, we discussed about them just a while ago. And the second type of questions can come like contrast, compare contrast, Yo-Yo and Sodo. Now in this drama, we find Yo-Yo is quite different compared to Sodo at the beginning. But at the latter part of the drama, we find Yo-Yo and Sodo are almost similar. But Yo-Yo recovers. Yo-Yo ultimately changes, realizes, but Sodo never realizes. Then you can think about Unsu as well in the same way. Su and Sodo, you find a lot, right? Then obviously, if you come, if you think about the grid I gave you at the beginning, uh, the table I gave you at the beginning, pre-war Japan and post-war Japan compare Karawa Su, Sodo and Unsu. Then we can think about the symbolic value of the characters. Symbolic value, representative value. We said that Zhu represents this Japan. Yo represents this Japan. Okay, Sodo represents this Japan. Otherwise, Zhu represents nature. Sodo represents capitalism. Perhaps gullible nature of uh, men, otherwise human beings, are represented by the characters Yo Yo and Zhu. And purity, even though children's character character is not children's character, I take it as one uh, character, is also kind of very symbolic, right? Even though there are no dialogues, uh, why dialogues? We find children's characters plays a very strong role. Can you remember the places that children appear and disappear? At the very beginning, we find that children appear and they request Sue to play with them. Why do you think that children loves to children love to play with the uh, zoo? It's kind of habit of children, right? Children can read adults. Sometimes, even though you bring you bring uh, you take kind of huge bar of chocolate, even though you offer that to a child, child would cry and rather reject you, because children can read the mind of uh, adults, because they have security instincts. Security instinct. They know they can sense whether there's danger, otherwise, no. 
sometimes they don't like spectacles they don't like beard they don't like sometimes uh, fat people tall people they have kind of uh, criteria for that they can sense so in this drama kinoshita suggests children to this i mean highlight the qualities of su su is almost like a child pure like a child and what about yoyo it says that yoyo used to play with these children in absence of uh, zu so that again gives us kind of a very good message then su's character su's character yoyo's character at the beginning these characters are almost like children but in the latter part we find children have agonizing song when su leaves so they are worried about they are rather worried about the change of the world so think about all these facets right yes uh, let's move on to the other part of yeah i'm sorry the second type of questions that is related to relationships su so and yoyo's relationship we had a contrast earlier but we can highlight su and yoyo's relationship what sort of relationships are there i mean what sort of a relationship that is yoyo sodo and unsu relationship will also be another important uh, facet then uh, questions related to social economic society economy and so on in this play we find uh kinoshita suggests a social criticism criticism he undercurrently discusses about how society of japan came to be the society that we see now so he has kind of a depression that she loved the previous japan now it is not found so that this japan is not welcomed by him so he writes a play to display that so in search he identifies uh, there's a there's a folk tale folk tale you know what a folk tale means uh, this folk tale can be utilized to tell my idea so he utilizes it and develops that to a script to the stage this will talk about growing capitalism so what characters display growing capitalism in the play what characters display what happens to growing what happens when growing cap capitalism takes place and what character what characters are victimized what characters become victorious then we talk about money and life capitalism and life so the <clears throat> fate of yoyo fate of yoyo and su and fate of unsu in front of sodo what about sodo sodo's fate ultimately what will happen to sodo no one will re retain with sodo ultimately when you become highly money oriented like you will die on a mattress of i mean pack of money but no one would come to sympathize or empathize with you they no one would try to understand no one would cry for your death okay so ultimately you find yes i have money but what can i do with this money then family is a very strong very strong notion we find here how family becomes typically suggested at the beginning how family is tainted and destroyed at the end then family versus money when you consider all these questions don't you notice that i discuss about discuss of the same same principle same point when you understand the core of the play you can transform that into any essay type question because all these multiple questions have the same core okay yo yo so as uh, odo and so children and the society so if you study the question study the literary text in that way any literary text in that way answering any of the questions is not a very big deal therefore i say guessing is guessing is not needed guessing is not really important guessing is important right because you you it reduces your work work but does it achieve the exact objective of this lesson otherwise subject then we discuss about ethics and values ethics human ethics human values how human ethics and values are contrasted with 
money. There can be questions related to techniques. These are certain techniques I want to, there are many techniques, but I feel like, you know, highlighting these techniques. We get irony, suspense, language, symbols, language and techniques. Okay, I have included that as well here. Uh, so you can study it in that way anyway. Irony, what is irony? Irony is of three types. Basically in literature, we identify irony as, irony has three facets. First is verbal irony. Irony you provide through your words. It means you tell something, you, your words, sorry, your words do not mean what you say. Example, I like you. I meant what I said. With my expression, you could understand that. I like you. But look at my expression now. I like you. I like you. I said something, but I meant something totally different. So irony can be of three types. The first is verbal irony, V-E-R-B-A-L, irony given through words. You find it in the bear by Anton Chekhov, like softer sex, softer sex. Here also we find in Sodo's words connected to, uh, Sodo's word utter to yo-yo, okay? Okay, that he, he is in, he ridicules yo-yo. There we find verbal irony. Second one, situational irony. Situational irony means you expect something to take place, but that does not take place. The completely opposite thing happens. Uh, in our society, we have kind of uh, sayings like, but we go to worship, but the covil falls onto your head. So we never expected that totally different thing happens. So do we find situational irony in this play? The very first thing is, I feel the transformation of crane and woman, right? We never expect a yo-yo to see a crane in that, but it's a crane, not a woman. Okay, and situational irony is there with Yo-Yo's character as well. We never expect Yo-Yo to become a transformed person at the, a transformed person at the beginning. We wanted Yo-Yo to stay as pure as ever, but Yo-Yo changes. We never expected Su would you Su would leave, but Su leaves. There are examples like that. Third type of irony is dramatic irony. What do you mean by dramatic irony? Dramatic irony, uh, sorry, I explained dramatic irony in the previous uh, lessons as well. Uh, dramatic irony, to complete dramatic irony, we at least need three parties. Example, you are the audience. I am one character and this is another character, right? So he's looking the other way. I take a piece of paper and write something and I hang it on the back of the person. Otherwise, but you do that. Then when I do that, of course, I know I pasted a tag. You know I pasted a tag because you are my audience. Does he know it? He doesn't know that. So the victimized, he is a victimized person. Victimized person doesn't know that there is something going on. He doesn't know that he is victimized without knowing that he behaves. So again, I say audience knows it, the one, the perhaps the culprit knows it, but the victim doesn't know that. So there we find when when that person walks, audience gets suspense, curiosity. And the other one is, uh, you get humor as well. You get humor. All right. So situational irony, sorry, dramatic irony is also utilized in this play at many places, right? Just for example, Sodo and Unsu hide themselves. When Yo-Yo and Su uh, 
were having kind of a discussion, right? And uh, Sodo and Nunsu peeped into the loom. Audience knew it. Sodo and Nunsu knew it. Zoo never knew it. Yo-Yo to never knew it. So that they were victimized. Sodo and Nunsu were the culprits. Audience witnessed it. So there we find suspense. And again, uh, may there are many places, right? There are many places. And uh, do you think that Yo-Yo knows that uh, Zoo is a train? No. We know it, right? And so do and so have kind of a suspicion. Not they don't know it perfectly well, but uh, the latter part, they come to know that, right? But when Yo-Yo wants to open the door of the loom, we get kind of suspense. We know that it's Sue, Sue who is rather transformed into a crane. And here we find so do and so know it because then they saw it and Yo-Yo, Yo-Yo comes to know that lately. So Yo-Yo one, one, was, one the, was the one who got victimized there. Okay, confirmed. Then I go to suspense. Suspense is used at many places in the play. We get suspense from the beginning of the drama. Like, we get certain stories, backstories, flashbacks about a wounded crane, how a wounded crane ultimately tra got transformed into a woman, otherwise a woman transformed into a crane. Like So such stories always make us curious about what goes on. And there's news as well. Sue came to this place, knocked on the door and said that she wanted to be Yo-Yo's wife. In this in this remote area, pastoral area, a beautiful woman, unknown to anybody, comes and suggests that she, she wants to be the wife of Yo-Yo. We get kind of suspense. Sometimes we put these stories together and we weave kind of curious story. Then uh, the next one is language of the play. You find characters... I mean, this is, the, this is a translation, right? We should not forget about that. It's not the exact Japanese version. Since it is a translation, there can be a lot of uh, differences, a lot of changes. But about the language of characters you notice? I had a discussion regarding this at the beginning. I needed to carefully examine the change of language of different characters. I will start with Sue's character. So, uses beautiful language with a beautiful flow. There is kind of poetic nature in his line, in her dialogues as well. But when Sue identifies Yo-Yo is not anymore the Yo-Yo that she used to rather experience, she finds her dialogues are disturbed. Her psychological confusion is displayed through the words. She stammers. Sometimes she speaks with broken sentences, fragmented sentences. Sometimes we have pauses, like yo yo, uh, uh, you uh, you are moving away to uh, an unknown world. Likewise, we don't find the dialogues are easily flowing. Similar thing happens to yo yo as well. If you examine yo yo's dialogues, you find yo yo's dialogues are very lovely. Ardent, A R D E N T, sweetheart, my love, and he's so careful about addressing Zoo. With all these, we find Yo Yo is identified as a very soft person. But as I told you, at the transition, otherwise, turning point of the play on page 56, 7, 57, like 55, 6, 7, if you carefully examine, we find Yo Yo's language is transformed into conditional language. He uses if clauses. If you don't do, I would rather go. Otherwise, weave the stuff right away with, uh, with a commanding language, imperative language. The language that sentence is started with a verb. He never uses sweetheart, right? He doesn't use wet words, soft words, okay? In the latter part, again, we find that Yo-Yo comes back to the same voice that he used to uh, address Yo uh, Zhu at the beginning. Sweetheart, don't leave. Please don't leave. Please don't leave. So, Sodo's language never changes. Then that is also another important facet of uh, writing 
characterization as well. When you discuss about the character, you can write about that as well. And when you talk about dynamic character, how characters change and how characters do not change, language to suggests you something very important. Okay. Then the next one is symbols. Uh, in this play, we find a lot of symbols. Uh, every character has a symbolic uh, representation. We should not forget about that. And in this play, we find a central symbol called Senbari. We discussed about that as well. There can be questions related to that. And uh, sometimes at the very beginning, you find that a hut, tumble down hut, it can be a symbol. Snow can be a symbol. And there is fire in the house. We know when there is fire in the house, uh, uh, it's not rather, house is rather burning, right? Fire in the house means that there is warmth in the house. Warm, warm, otherwise family warmth. Now we find a kind of a contrast at the beginning. House, there's fire in the house, but outside we find snow. Contrast between cold and hot. So such uh, representations are there in the play. And uh, yes, children represent something. Crane represents something. Okay, the time of the action, like twilight represents something. So we had a long discussion about all these. And uh, yes, I think uh, that I came across a lot. And uh, so I tried my level best to rather uh, summarize it within this little time and make sure that you identify uh, the representative value of this literary text. Make sure that you identify how the society is represented through this particular drama. Kinoshita was not only a storyteller. Okay, he was not only a storyteller. He had kind of uh, uh, deep notions rather than telling a story. Therefore, I find that Kinoshita had kind of a social uh, responsibility in presenting this drama and presenting what happened to Japan in the uh, in the in the twentieth century, mainly because of war, violence, how people's lives are changed socio-economic, political conditions are changed, how relationships are affected, how human emotions are affected, that he affected. And he takes this as kind of a responsibility and presents his drama to the public. So then uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening to me and wish you all the best for your examinations.